Welcome back. Today I'm going to briefly introduce you to a history-dependent non-Boltzmann sampling technique called metadynamics. What do you mean with history-dependent non-Boltzmann sampling technique? Quite simple. As you might remember from the video about non-Boltzmann sampling techniques in general, what we are doing is to add a bias potential to our phase space in order to force our system to explore the phase space in a way that we want. Now, there are some techniques where you have to give as an input this bias potential. I know it beforehand. In the case of metadynamics, that's not the case. It's calculated depending on how the molecular dynamics run is going on. Therefore, it's history dependent. Now, the interesting part about metadynamics is that when you are studying a process or a system with metadynamics, you can both explore completely and thoroughly the phase space of this system or of this process, the conformation of phase space, and at the same time, you can also get a free energy estimate of the process. Getting the free energy estimate can be a bit computationally expensive, but still you're getting two birds with one stone. So, how does it work? What are we actually doing in this metadynamics? So, in a metadynamics, we will choose some kind of coordinate along the phase space or, or a linear combination of a series of coordinates. It might be the diagonal angle of a molecule. It could be the distance between two atoms. It could be whatever angle, distance or linear combination of atom distances, angles, etc, etc, etc that we like. It could be also a reaction path, it could be whatever. A metadynamics, these are usually called collective variables. So if in a paper on metadynamics you find something written like CV or collective variable, it's simply a linear combination of coordinates in the conformational phase space. So, let's see an easy example. Let's have dichloroethylene. We can have it in our trans conformation. Of course, you will have hydrogens here. And it's in equilibrium with the cheese conformation. But as we know, this process is pretty slow, so we are not going to experience it in a normal molecular dynamic run, usually. So, what we are going to do is, for example, we consider our collective variable, so our coordinate in the phase space, to be the dihedral angle between the two chloride atoms. So, this is our CV. And this is our potential energy. Now, we know that this is more stable than this one, so we might imagine the phase space to be something like this, where we have a lower part and a higher part and a quite high energy barrier that makes it difficult to go from one side to another, or at least makes it slow. Now, if we start here, for example, the most stable part, and we would like, for example, to know the rate at which we can get this conformational change and the free energy associated, the probability of seeing this change. So in general, we want to know this potential, how it looks like, how deep it is, etc., etc., etc. What could we do? But what we do in metadynamics is with a certain rate that we will call W0, that in the end is, it's a frequency, so 1 on tau, 
Il, we will deposit there where our particle is in that moment in the phase space some kind of repulsive potential that is local, so traditionally a Gaussian. In this way, our particle won't be so interested or so likely to be in the same position as it was before anymore, and it will start moving, for example, here. And after a certain amount of time, depending on our rate, we will add another Gaussian, and therefore our particle might move here, and so on we start building up Gaussians until we will start actually seeing the particle to explore other minima in the phase space. And of course, this minima will slowly be filled too. And in this way, we will be able to explore all the accessible minima. Then, we, at a certain point, we will arrive where we have converged our metadynamics, therefore where the potential energy along this coordinate is flat. Therefore, in this case, you will simply have that uh, we will have continuously this chloride to rotate one respect to another. At this point, you can stop your metadynamics and you actually have all the information you were looking for because you know how many and how big these Gaussians are and therefore you actually have the calc of the free energy surface and therefore you can do any calculation you know how deep this part is you know how deep this part is therefore you can know the probability you know how large this part is you have, I said, on one side explored the system on the other side, you have the free energy that of this process because you know everything about the free energy landscape along this coordinate or this collective variable as it's called in metadynamics. Another use case in which this is used is also, for example, to calculate the binding free energy of a protein ligand system and in the meantime, also to see how this ligand behaves inside the protein pocket and in the solvent. So what it's, is usually done is you have your protein with your pocket. And it's also interesting because you can also see how the pocket behaves if you want to, depending on how you choose your collective variables. Then usually they put a potential that is with a funnel form in order to avoid the ligand to start exploring parts where we are absolutely not interested in. In fact, it's often called funnel metadynamics in this case because of this potential that simply traps the ligand there where we are interested in. And then you start forcing the ligand to explore all the conformations on the pocket. If you want, you can also force the pocket to explore his conformations. And then also the conformations inside the ligand until you arrive to a convergence. In this way, you will both have understood which the best binding poses are of the ligand inside the protein, how the protein might adapt to the ligand and to the ligand in different positions, also how the ligand might behave nearby the protein, and you will also get the binding free energy of this protein ligand system. Some not obvious things about using metadynamics in more complex situations than the dichloroethylene, like this one, is which collective variables should I use? And that's a good question. There are many choices and yeah, it's a bit of an art to understand what's the right thing for your system. How big or how small should this funnel be in order to don't bias too much what the ligand is doing. If you make it too small, you might bias the ligand to be too much inside the pocket. If you make it too big, your molecular dynamics run will never ever end. So this is another application. Now, there are some things you have to think about. First of all, you want to explore how your system behaves at equilibrium. Therefore, you have to throw your Gaussians slowly. 
in order to always stay at an almost equilibrium state. The problem is, if you are in a situation where there is a very deep minimum and then some other stuff you're interested in, and you start here, or you f end up here, it will take you ages to fill it up enough in order to start exploring the other path. So what can you do in order to avoid this problem? Quite simple. You can use, instead of having a fixed rate at which you throw your Gaussians, you can have a time-dependent rate. That will be nothing more than our time-independent rate multiplied by a time-dependent probability. Therefore, what we are going to do is start quicker and then our time-dependent probability will reduce the probability to throw our Gaussian in order to slow the process down. There are many formulas you can use depending on your system and your problem. But in this way you can fill it up quickly there where you couldn't care less and then start filling up slowly there where you are actually interested in to see the equilibrium behavior of your system. Another problem that you might have thought about is, first of all, why are we using Gaussians and not other uh, local functions? And second, Gaussians have very long tails. Therefore, even though I wanted to influence my phase space only, for example, here, Actually, my very long tails will start influencing stuff elsewhere. And that's not really something we want to, don't want to influence here or here. So, first of all, why are Gaussians used? But simple, Gaussians are local and are very quick to integrate and derive. That's the reason why you will see them used very often. You also see them in quantum chemistry, for example. They're local and they can be analytically derived and integrated. And that makes everything very, very quick. But as I said, we will have this problem of having these tails. One thing you might do is to smoothly truncate the tail in order to bring our Gaussian to zero. So let's make a, something that makes more sense. You simply, if this is zero, you simply smoothly truncate it, your Gaussian in order to arrive to zero. This can work, but the problem is that it, it gives a layer of complexity to the process because you don't simply have one simple function that represents everything. You actually must always remember at a certain point you have to consider this new smoothed and cut and new smoothing function here. And you might bring in some discontinuity. Or on the you might avoid discontinuity on the function level directly, but probably one derivative at a certain point will be discontinuous. And yeah, that is going to slow things down. It's more complex maybe to also debug a program if you write it like this etc etc so actually someone came out with a kind of functions called lucy's function and a lucy function is nothing more than a gaussian that has no tails so there were a gaussian would have tails this lucy function doesn't have it but in the other side it's equivalent to a gaussian and uh, it's there it has an analytical integration and derivation as Gaussians have, but also all the derivatives are continuous and well behaving also in the point where the function stops and becomes zero. So yeah, you have many choices of what function you want to use as long as the function is localized, everything will be okay. But of course, if it has tails, you will have to deal with them. Otherwise, there are some other functions, like for example, Lucy's functions. Metadynamics can be used on many kinds of systems and many kinds of problems, both if you simply want to explore the space and both if you actually want to go to convergence, so where the potential energy is flat, the energy estimate. 
the only problem can be that if you have very deep potential energy minima, uh, your MD run could be very, very long. But for the rest, it's a very interesting and very flexible method. I hope you enjoyed the video. All the sources and the materials I used to do it are written in the description below. And here is some more content for you. But wait, don't click on it yet. First remember to leave a feedback in the comments section to let me know what you think about it. Like, subscribe, follow me on social media, links in the description. And if you would like to support the channel, consider to donate on Patreon. Again, link in the description below. See you next time. I'm Maurice Karnbrock for The Computational Chemist.